Welcome back to Carnadies.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, You Can't Handle the Truth. In this video, we are also continuing with Alfred Tarski's Theory of Truth, our mini-series within the series on that. But unlike we said in the last video, where we said we were going to be talking about the indefinability of truth next, we are going to take a little step in between to look at a dumbfounding definition, dizzying distinction and diabolical doctrine, being what is a girdle? number. So, Gödel used a numbering system to translate particular propositions into numbers for his proof of the incompleteness theorems. Tarski uses the same system or a similar system to prove the indefinability of truth, so we're going to take a brief look at that here. So in order to get to Tarski's proof of indefinability, there are a few tools we will need. Gödel numbers, free variables, arithmetization, substitutions, and a process that Douglas Hofstadter, the author of Gödel Escher Bach, calls arithmoquining after quine. With these tools, we will be able to show that truth cannot be defined within any particular language. It can be defined from an outside meta-language, but within a language, we cannot offer a definition of truth, because we're going to violate Convention T. Now, in the proof of Gödel's incompleteness theorem, Gödel creates a numbering scheme which translates the strings of a particular language into unique numbers. Each of the elements of the alphabet are assigned a particular number. Then the numbers representing the symbols in the string are placed end-to-end -to, -end to create one larger number. This makes it so that every formula has a unique Gödel number, and every unique Gödel number, if translated correctly, is going to have a formula it can be translated into. And you can have a function, or just a relation, that translates back and forth between them. It's also interesting, something we won't get to here, is that our then typographical rules of proofs, so that you can prove this line from this line, or this line from this line, can actually be then translated into arithmetic rules which say you can multiply by 100 and add 123 to a particular string. Okay? So, we're not going to get into those translations here yet, but we are going to cover the basics of girdle numbers. So, if we take the definitions to the side, we can translate some basic strings into girdle numbers. For example, TP, the predicate T being prefaced over the proposition P could be translated as 777-232-999-323, because the 777 represents the T, as you see on the side we have 777 equals T, the 232 is the open parentheses, the 999 is the P, and the 323 is the closed parentheses. We put the commas in between, not only because of the standard convention of writing really large numbers, you put a comma every three digits, but also because by doing that we can very clearly see which set of numbers represents which letter. We can also translate this little bit more complicated statement for all P and all Q. P or Q and not Q implies P, basically a statement of the rule of disjunctive syllogism. We can translate that as this really long number. I encourage you to go through the number, see if I made any mistakes in there, but I'm pretty sure it's basically correct. We have 232 representing the open bracket, 111 representing the universal quantifier, 999 being P, and so on and so forth. Okay? Hopefully that makes sense for a basic understanding of what we mean by translating girdle numbers into propositions and propositions back into girdle numbers. At some point, we're going to learn about a method for representing numbers in logic known as successorship. But for now, we're going to take each of the 10 digits as separate symbols, just to keep things simple. Now, there's a great deal that can be done with girdle numbers from this point. We can, as I said, translate all of our rules of propositional calculus into rules about arithmetic, and even go on to prove Gödel's theorem. In a future video, we may look at these ramifications, but for now, we're just going to use them to understand these 
other relations and these other tools that we have. I have done a video on Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which is a basics video. At some point, hopefully, we will do a full series really delving into and digging into how Gödel proves those theorems using some of these really interesting methods. Now, the next tool we're going to use is known as a free variable. Free variables are something we've covered before, but just as a review, they're variables, p, q, n, m, etc., in formulas which are not under a quantifier. That means that they don't have a quantifier next to them at the beginning or at any point in the statement. So variables are under a quantifier, then they're called bound variables. Variables can represent both propositions and numbers, now that we're introducing kind of numbers very basically into our propositional calculus. We'll use variables like n and m to represent numbers. And in this case, they're going to just be girdle numbers. We'll use variables like p and q to represent propositions. For example, in the following formula, p and n are bound variables, while q and m are free variables. So look at this carefully. At the beginning of the statement, we have for all p, there exists some n. Such that, and we continue on. P and Q. You note that P was bound at the beginning by a universal quantifier, but Q was not. We didn't have a for all Q or there exists a Q at the beginning. So Q is free while P is bound. Or A N implies A M, so on and so forth. So it should be clear that that N is quantified by the existential quantifier at the beginning. So N is bound, M doesn't have any quantifiers, so M is free. Hopefully you understand that. We talk a little bit about free variables in the final 10 days of the first 100 days of logic. Check those videos out if you're a little confused, but hopefully this is pretty intuitive if you have a basic understanding of propositional calculus. Now, Next up, we have arithmetization. The third tool we'll need to learn about is arithmetization. This is a relation between a number and a proposition. Remember, relations are two-part predicates, or predicates that take two things as their constituent parts. So we'll rep represent it with a, open parenthesis, n, comma, p, close parenthesis. It's always going to be a number first and a proposition second. And we'll translate it as P is the translation of the girdle number N. For example, A, 155555155, comma, M equals M is true, since under the definitions we've offered, 155555155 translates to M equals M. Okay? So, if you were to plug in some number that was not a girdle number or was not the correct girdle number for a proposition, that would just make this whole predicate false. It would say that this relation does not apply between this predicate and this proposition. The important thing to note here is this isn't some action or new type of thing for our predicate calculus. It's just a relation, the same way that you could say that something is to the left of something else. We're not moving something to the left of it. We're not actually doing the action of translating something into something else. We're simply stating that these two things bear that relation to each other. Hopefully that makes sense. But if it doesn't, let's look at some examples. So here's a very clear example of how we could arithmetize P and Q implies P. We have each of the numbers that corresponds to the particular symbol under that symbol there. And so all arithmetization does is express that a particular number and the correct translation of that particular number bear a relation to each other, namely the arithmetization relation. Okay, so the fourth tool that we will need is another relation called substitution. And this is probably the most complicated of the tools. Arithmetic quining gets a little more complicated, but only because it involves substitution. This is going to hold between ordered sets of three girdle numbers. Basically, it claims that if you take the first girdle number, arithmetize it, or translate it into a function, then plug the second girdle number in for 
all of the free variables in the resulting equation, then arithmetize it back into a girdle number, the result will be the final girdle number. We're going to represent it as S for substitution, L and M, where L, N, and M are all numbers. Okay? This might be a little confusing, but to clarify, let's take a look at an example. So, to be clear, some three numbers, L, N, M, bear the substitution relation to each other, if and only if. The arithmetization of M is identical to the arithmetization of L, but with all of the free variables in L having been replaced by N. Not the arithmetization of N, but N itself. Okay? Hopefully that makes sense, but if not, here's an example. It's a little complicated and there's a lot of numbers, but trust me, it's going to make sense. So, we have S and we have three numbers, each of which is on a separate line. And I've put spaces and commas in between to distinguish between just the normal commas between the numbers. So, we have this first long string, comma, this second really kind of short string, and this third really long string that goes on to two lines. And this would be true. Why? Because the first number translates into, if you translate each of those things in that first line where the S is, into there exists some P such that N is the arithmetization of P. The second number translates to Q or not Q. And the third translates to there exists some P such that that's the arithmetization of that second number is P. Hopefully you can see the reason we have all of those eights in that third number is because we're actually representing each of those numbers in that statement. As you can see, what we did was we substituted the second number in for the free variable in the first formula, which was n, to get the third one, the third number. And the third number was just the arithmetization of that proposition. It's important to note that this doesn't have to be true. So this does seem to happen to be a true statement. There exists some P such that this it's a proposition that 666-919-100-666 can be translated into, namely Q or not Q. But that third number, that third arithmetization, doesn't need to be true for the substitution relation to hold. What needs to be the case is that if you plug in the second number into all of the free variable slots in the first number, you will get the third number. That's what needs to be true. It doesn't need to be the case that the third number represents a proposition that is actually true. Hopefully, that makes sense. All right, the final tool we're going to learn about will combine all of the tools we've learned so far. Arithmetic-quinization is a relation between two girdle numbers. It claims if we take the first girdle number in the relation, turn it into an equation, a formula, a string, and then plug that first girdle number, the same girdle number we just turned into a formula, in for all of the instances of a free variable in that equation, then the girdle number of that equation or formula is the second girdle number. So if the second girdle number in the relation is this new girdle number, the relation is true. If not, it is false. We're going to represent this relation with Q, N, M. Okay? Now, if you're paying attention and you have a good understanding of substitution, you should be able to see that arithmetic is just substitution where the first two numbers are the same. Or in other words, we could define Q, N, M as S, N, N, M. So if you're having trouble with arithmetic quining, go back to substitution, practice it, understand it, and then just use the first number twice to get what arithmetic quining is, what that relation is. All of these methods will be what Tarski uses to prove that it is impossible to define truth for a language within that language, and rigorously prove that the liar's paradox makes truth indefinable. At least within a language. 
that was what is a girdle number next time we will actually be doing the indefinability of truth watch this video and more here at carnades.org and stay skeptical everybody